Let's get started with our first guest. She is Anne Hand, the chairman and CEO of Super League Gaming. This is one company at the center of competitive video gaming. So we are super honored to have her here today. So gaming, of course, Anne has had a moment, many moments, I would say, as video games have become now a real source of go-to entertainment and for people to connect. We know gaming is very social. So let's just start with giving those who are not as familiar with Super League Gaming what the company is and what you're seeing in terms of the trends. Yeah, so the company was founded about six years ago. And the premise that was that with all the excitement happening at the professional esports level, that there would inevitably be more thirst, more interest to, um, you know, for every day to have an opportunity to compete in new and different ways beyond the already very competitive gameplay that exists. Um, you know, we kind of used esports as a little bit of the Trojan horse there, you know, it was a hot kind of topic, this notion of the, the void and competitive gaming for everyday gamers. But we're not focused on the 10,000 professionals, we're focused on the fact that there's 3 billion gamers out there on the planet and 50% identify as highly competitive. And so it's really speaking to that highly competitive gamer and the different ways that we could aggregate community, um, you know, to aggregate a nice diverse audience of gamers across different ages and skill levels and genres of games and aggregate their content, right? Tournaments is just one way we extract content. Um, what I would say are the trends is, is it the entry point looked like the big trend was more and more competitive video gaming and, and this notion of esports, but there's just bigger trends afoot. So first, gaming's already way bigger than, than any other form of entertainment, bigger than TV, three times the size of the global film box office. That was all pre-COVID. Of course, COVID has only further powered that. Um, the other thing is, and, and this one always surprises investors the most. It, frankly, it, it surprised me a bit when I was getting into the space because gaming's changed a lot since the days of me playing Galaga and Centipede, right? And so um, one of the things that surprised me is that when you look at how much time players are spending socializing and watching other people's gameplay, it's more hours than they're actually playing the game themselves. So that's a bit of, of, of a wake up call that, again, this interactive form of socializing, and entertaining, it's not even just about the play itself. Um, I think another important macro trend is obviously the rise of 5G broadband, more cloud based gaming, which means if I want to be a competitive gamer, I don't have to invest in expensive broadband and, and the heavy hardware that exists for it. Um, so that makes gaming even more accessible. And then the thing that I would also say that I think is probably the greatest force of what's happening when you look at what the Super League platform does is we're pushing tools into the hands of everyday gamers to create their own competitive gameplay and viewing content. And when we do that, what we're really doing is feeding into this trend that these days everybody can be a content creator. The democratization of the content creator class, it's not five big studios pushing down content, it's millions of everyday content creators being able to push their content up in this new world that we're in where we have media completely disaggregated. I'm so glad we started with you and you gave us the backdrop, especially if you can repeat that figure again. So how many competitive gamers are there in the world? Yeah, 3 billion gamers in total and about 48% identify as highly competitive. We looked at three factors in determining that. Um, first, they're playing a minimum of eight hours of gameplay a week. Now, if you have a kid playing Fortnite, you could only hope it was only eight hours. They're watching an additional nine hours of someone else's gameplay content. And that's not just the professional stuff. That's about the fact that watching gameplay is actually entertaining. It's about the shoutcaster, the influencer. And then the third metric is they've probably invested in some kind of peripheral, maybe a Turtle Beach headset or a Logitech gaming mouse, something that allows them to level up and play a little more competitively. Now, that last point said, what I would clarify is that now that mobile gaming is becoming more and more competitive and there are legitimate um, competitive esports teams out there, professional teams that are playing around mobile titles. It just further again makes esports and competitive gaming um, accessible to anyone who's holding a smartphone. And I think the context that you gave, and thank you for repeating it, is important because I think most people, uh, you know, still look at movies and, and television as uh, where some of those big ad dollars are going. There's an estimated three billion, though. Let's just talk about professional esports. 
uh, just first, before we get to all of the other things, which you mentioned, of course, when you are looking at just collective viewing of other people watching games, uh, that's something different. But if we just look at the professional esports revenue, there is an estimated revenue for 2022 of about three billion, and that's up from 655 million in 2017. How do you look at that pie? And then also, if you talk about this viewership pattern that you're watching, uh, how, how do you really allocate your your strategy to tackling both sides of the equation? Yeah, so th that's one of my favorite questions um, because. First, look at the audience for the pro level. Well, it's it's north of 400 million uh, viewers globally. It's already bigger than the National Hockey League, than the MLB, right? So that again is a first wake up call for investors who realize that this fan base is massive. But again, they're only watching this several thousand professional players, but yet there's so much other gaming content that is being consumed. Now that said, the monetization model for the pro teams does at least today still somewhat mirror a traditional sports team. You know, it's ticketing, it's merchandise, it's broadcast rights, it's sponsorship. Um, and uh, if you, you know, we have a, share a lot of common investors with some of the pro teams, like the owners of Team Liquid, the Immortals, Team Envy, um, Cl Cloud9, they're investors in our company as well. So we, they're kind of like family. We know a lot about those business models. And what they are trying to do is find another leg of revenue something that goes beyond. So like when you hear like a phase clan or 100 thieves out there, they're really much more like content and lifestyle entertainment companies on top of that traditional sports model. The reason I love the question about the 3 billion in 2022, um, I've been kind of vocal on this, you know, um, that stat is fine, but that stat only rec um, represents what's been known in the professional esports system. So it is simply extrapolating out, um, you know, the you know the ticketing and the merch and all those revenue streams I talked about for those big mega events where people are piling into Mass and Square Garden or Staples. If you think about a classic pyramid structure, you've got ten thousand pros at the top. We're talking about the three billion. So I ran a, a, a $3 billion PL at BP, a global PL. We had 3,000 employees. I thought it was pretty large. But in the scheme of things, that's nothing. And all the smart people that are around esports and on this call would not be investing in this space if we thought the whole pie to divide amongst us was $3 billion. It is way bigger than that. And we just don't even know how to define the edges of the pie. Before we get into our next two guests, and we're going to bring Anne back later for a roundtable, I want you, if you can, share a little bit to share a little bit more about your M&A strategy, uh, especially your most recent purchase. Yeah, so we announced our intention to acquire a company called Mob Crush. We've known the company for about five years. It just fits beautifully with our model. And some of that is, is that over time, when you're in a nascent space, you start to hone your strategy, right? And we slowly figured out we had marched pretty much in alignment with each other. Um, first, we're all about that middle tier of that pyramid. So whether it's the person who wants to broadcast their gameplay using Mob Crush tools, or it's the person who wants to create gameplay experiences for themselves and their friends using Super League tools, it's about putting those tools in. So these are both user-generated content platforms. Um, we happen to have um, 3 million plus registered players we have a top 50 Nielsen property when you combine our two audiences from a viewership point of view. So it's just a massive content library that we, we can put together. We monetize three simple ways. The first one is, is that we have a leading in-game and in-stream ad model. And this is not about crummy programmatic advertising and display ads that ruin the gamer experience. This is about in-game and in-stream inventory that is a very premium CPM and allows brands to reach this cord cutting, ad blocking, um, you know, Gen Z audience exactly where they are, they're gaming, right? And the second model is we both have direct to consumer businesses. It both happens to be um, overlap beautifully with our young teen audience. So that's a 13 to 18 year old demographic that inside our gameplay and streaming um, businesses can actually buy microtransactions or goods. And then the third that we think is the, the really untapped exciting piece is when you look at the amount of content the two companies amass, 
we already have a deal with Snapchat where we're, we're giving them some of that derivative content, those highlight reels for monetization. So we already have proof points at Super League that people value this content. There's a massive void and thirst for more gaming centric content. So we know there's interest in it. When you combine those two libraries, it's valuable. But we also believe that just as many um, companies adjacent to esports are interested in our production and broadcast streaming technology as well. So we think content and content technology monetization is a third leg of the stool.